just going to give him a second to hop on. All right, awesome. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda. I am a marketing and sales coordinator with Metalcon. I would like to thank you all for joining us for today's Metalcon Live. Um, first, I would like to just discuss the MCA, our partners. Um, if interested, you would get a 10% discount on exhibiting uh, at Metal, a 10% discount at Metalcon. Uh, members only access for information and networking and decision making opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, you can contact Jeff Irwin. Um, just a couple of important dates that you may want to save. March 8th is going to be our next Metalcon Live. We will be talking about role forming basics. And then on March 22nd, we do have a special Metalcon Live for future leaders. Um, finally, our call for presentations is open and we have extended the deadline to February 28th. So if you do have any content you would like to submit for presentation, please do that before the 28th. And as always, MetalCon will be taking place October 18th through the 20th at the Las Vegas Convention Center. You're more than welcome to go to metalcon.com to learn more. You can enter your email address to stay up to date on all the latest news. And don't forget to fill out the post-survey webinars to get your certificate and the AIA credit. That is all for me, and I'm going to let Todd take over the rest of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you all for attending today. And um, thank you to MetalCon Live for this opportunity. So um, I am going to try to share my screen here so that you all don't have to keep looking at me. Let me see. Okay, does that look good, Amanda? Yes, it does. Great. So just so everyone knows, um, if you have any questions during the midst of this, feel free to use the little Q&A box or the chat box there on your Zoom screen. And Amanda is going to be monitoring those for me and she'll just break in and let me know if there are any questions that come up along the way. So um, just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Todd Miller. I am president of Isaiah Industries, which is a manufacturer of metal roofing systems. Um, I've been around the industry uh, for about 40 years, 42 years, I guess, uh, working with contractors uh, across the country and really the world on a variety of projects. So I'm I'm pleased to provide this information to you. So this really is just some sort of information that we have pulled together to sort of explain um, the hallmarks of what we see as being successful management of metal roofing projects. So there's a variety of ways um, that you may find yourself installing a metal roof. Um, maybe your company actually sold it to property owners. Maybe it was specified by an architect or a property owner and you were the fortunate one who was awarded the project. Uh, maybe you've been hired as a subcontractor to install a metal roof for another contractor, but regardless, um, here you are and you've got this project in front of you. So what we want to look at today are ways to manage that project so that it goes smoothly and is successful both for you and also for your client and the property owner. Um, ideally, too, because of their uniqueness, a metal roof installation really should bring you referrals for future work that you can do. Um, of course, it will require a well-managed project in order for that to happen. Um, so one of the things that I think we have all, if you've been in business or construction any length of time at all, one of the things we have all learned is that proper planning prevents poor performance. Now, there are some variants of that saying that perhaps you have heard, but it boils down to um, planning well um, helps to make sure that performance is good, and it also helps to ensure that you have happy clients, um, happy customers. So um, the things that we are going to talk about today may seem like they're going to take you some extra time and, and extra effort, maybe some extra training on the part of your team members. Um, but these are things that will pay off in the long run, and these are things that um, top-notch 
professional contractors out there are doing every day. Um, so before we start to sort of walk through a metal roofing project from start to finish, um, I want to discuss the importance of knowing what you're doing in regards to installing the roof, making sure that you've got that skill set. So there are four basic types or kinds of metal roofs. And while flashing details may have similarities between the various types of metal roofs, nothing is ever going to replace training and experience with the individual type of product that you're installing. So there are four general types of products is the way I kind of break it down. Uh, one is exposed fastener corrugated sheets. So these are corrugated sheets that um, typically are custom length, cut to length anymore these days, didn't used to be, um, but they usually are these days. And you actually drive uh, your screws right through them to fasten them securely to the roof deck. Um, another general type of metal roof is a mechanically seamed standing seam. So these are concealed fastened panels that go up with clips and they're, they're secured to the roof with clips. And then you run some sort of an electric seamer or eh, if you're old school, you might do it with hand uh, crimpers, but you actually um, fold the metal tight on the seam so that you can get a watertight uh, lock on your seams. Uh, another general type of metal roof is what we call snap lock standing seam. Uh, so a snap lock standing seam is where the panels do just that. You basically clip them together and, and you force the one on top. You force the female lock down on top of your male lock and it snaps and it, it is there securely. So there again, these are concealed fastened products, um, oftentimes with clips. Uh, but there is also a variant of snap lock standing seam many of you may be familiar with uh, called nail hem. And so it basically has a, an, a concealed nail fastener strip or screw strip. Uh, no one really uses nails typically, but um, it has a concealed fastener strip along one edge of every panel. And then the final type, general type of metal roof we are uh, sometimes you may run into is what we call modular panels, or they're also metal shingles they're referred to. And so the metal shingles may come in a variety of profiles and colors and shapes, maybe to look like wood shake or look like barrel tile or, tile or look like flat tile or look like slate or even to look like conventional asphalt shingles. So now while each of these four general types of metal roofing has its own aesthetics, its own look, each type also has its own attribute and installation requirement and installation details as well. Um, and in addition to the differences that you find between these different product categories in terms of how you might install them, how you might detail them, how you might flash them, you're also going to find that there can be differences from product to product um, and from manufacturer to manufacturer within each category. Um, so training on these systems is generally available for most manufacturers. Uh, many of them offer training at uh, their own location or regional locations, um, but many of them also have a way to offer job site training to you as well. Um, and there's no doubt about it that you as a contractor being able to say that you have factory training uh, can be very beneficial. And you'll also find that factory training occasionally pops up as a requirement in architectural specifications as well. Now, one other thing that some folks take advantage of is there are some experts across the country uh, who can be hired as consultants uh, to come in and work with you for project management, job site supervision, and installation training. Um, if anyone like that would ever be helpful to you as a contractor, um, I would really suggest checking with your product manufacturer and seeing who they may suggest. So, um, let's move ahead uh, and look at some specific attributes of successful management of a metal roofing project. Now, because every project is going to have its own nuances and its own characteristics, not necessarily everything I talk about is going to apply to every metal roofing project you encounter. Um, likewise, I'm giving these in kind of a general order, but the exact order you may encounter these on a particular project 
may indeed vary from job to job. Um, but still, um, I hope that these are all things and information that is helpful to you. Um, so one of the first things you have to start with is product selection. And of course, a lot of times product selection would have been done long before you and your crews show up on the job. Um, product selection may have been done by an architect or the property owner, um, but it's still critical. And the reality is, if you agree to installing a particular product on a specific project, you really are in essence saying that that product is indeed appropriate for that project. So that is something you're kind of agreeing to. And so I, I mentioned earlier those four basic types of metal roofs. And it's important to remember that each of those general types of metal roofing really has its own requirements um, as far as the types of projects it can be used on. They also have their own peculiarities. Um, and so you got to consider that, you know, you want to make sure that the product being installed is appropriate for that particular building. Um, so I'm going to zero in as we think about that. I'm going to zero in on four specific things to think about, which I think impact the appropriateness of installing a particular product on a certain specific building. Number one is roof pitch. Um, no metal roof product should ever be used below its minimum recommended pitch as specified by the manufacturer or by building code. I got to say, over my years, there have been countless times I've seen folks try to use products below their minimum pitch, and they'll say things like, oh, I'll just beef up the underlayment to keep it from leaking. And I hate to tell you, that simply doesn't work over the long term. Uh, manufacturers, you know, the reality is we kind of like to sell product and we'd love to sell our product for every roof out there. Um, but sometimes we can't. And so when a manufacturer specifies a minimum pitch, it is imperative that it be taken seriously. Um, if not, there will be ramifications and problems with that project at some point down the road. Um, so let's look at minimum pitches for the, the basic types of metal roofs I just went through. Um, generally speaking, exposed fastener metal roofs will have a minimum pitch of a 312. Some are 212 based upon their manufacturer recommendation. Um, so all of these, you always want to check with a specific manufacturer regarding the particular product you're installing. These are just some general rules of thumb here. Um, so snap lock standing seams typically have a required minimum pitch of 212. Uh, mechanically seam standing seam roofs. Now that's again, where those panels are actually crimped together for water tightness. And, and you can actually almost, well, you could, you can pond water on them and have it stay out of the structure. So mechanical seam standing seam roofs typically have um, a minimum pitch of a half and 12. Again, you're gonna find different variances and different products out there. So you always want to check on your particular product. Um, modular metal shingles usually have a 312 minimum pitch. And the interesting thing on modular metal shingles, a lot of times folks miss, is they actually create kind of a negative pitch by the way they're formed. So for example, if you were to install a, let's say, a press formed metal shake, and it has a top to bottom exposure of 12 inches, and yet it has a formed butt thickness of one inch, well, you're creating a negative 112 pitch. So if you install that roof on a 112 pitch, the panels are basically sitting there flat. Um, so again, can't stress enough how critical it is that you always uh, adhere to and do not go below minimum specified pitches. Uh, so next, I want to talk a little bit about fasteners and fastener places, uh, fastener placement, excuse me. Um, also along these lines, though, is the question of whether the product being installed is architectural, uh, meaning it requires solid decking beneath of it, beneath it, or if it's a structural panel, 
um, meaning that it can be installed on top of purlins or space boards and of course open framing and you know that's what we see here in this photo you see is a typical sort of pole barn construction uh, where the panel is a structural panel that is installed over open framing. Um, again, I can't say enough, it's critical to always adhere to the manufacturer requirements and also to building code requirements. <clears throat> so manufacturers of all products are also going to have requirements in terms of the type of fasteners that their products should be used with. Now, they're going to be specifying the fasteners that their products have been performance tested with. And so it's important if you're going to be referencing any of their test data, um, any of their ICC listings or other code listings, um, you've got to use the same fasteners that they tested with or the same general type of fastener that they tested with. Um, likewise, they're going to be specifying the spacing and the placement of those fasteners as well, um, as that can also have an impact on roof performance in particular um, as it pertains to wind uplift performance. Um, additionally, if you are in a high velocity wind zone, a coastal area, um, there may be specific fastening requirements that are also required to meet local building codes. So base metal is another critical factor when considering what sort of product is appropriate for what sort of project. Uh, so while steel and aluminum are common metals used in metal roofing, there are also more exotic metals used such as copper, zinc, uh, even titanium, and some other metals. Um, each of these metals is going to have its own attributes. Um, metal specification is generally going to be done by the manufacturer of that metal roof panel, um, based upon their performance expectations and other things. Um, in this photo here, the image I should say on the slide, you see uh, top right is, I believe, a gavelume roof. Bottom right is a zinc roof. Uh, that's on a cool facility in Dayton, Ohio. And the, the photo on the left is actually a solid copper roof that has been press formed uh, into a shingle shape. Um, of course, when you get into steel, uh, there are also different types of steel, such as galvanized, galvalume, um, even others such as Zalmag. Um, I always suggest if you are involved in product selection and you have the opportunity to do so, you should consult with the metal roofing manufacturer to ensure that the best metal and the best product for the project is being used. And a lot of times they're gonna look at things like, you know, what are the particular requirements of that project? What are the uh, typical weather patterns? What is needed as far as strength, as far as corrosion resistance and other attributes. Now, the other thing I wanna mention um, is the type of coating or finish that is on the product. Um, so some product profiles um, are actually available with multiple finish options, and each one of those finish options is going to have its own price point and its own quality level. Um, but generally speaking, as you look at the full myriad of metal roofs available today, you're going to find there are four basic types of finishes used on metal roofs. Um, specifying a finish that is robust enough to meet your customer expectations is critical. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the exact needs are going to be very little bit based upon the environmental demands where that roof is being installed. Um, as examples, areas prone to high amounts of ultraviolet light, um, areas prone to corrosion catalysts such as um, a lot of moisture, tropical weather, salt, um, salt spray, salt environments, and of course acid rain. Uh, those are all create challenging environments that will often be worthy of a more robust coating on the metal. So I want to look at the four general types of finishes or coatings that you're going to find on metal roofs. The first 
uh, type of finish is actually no finish. Um, yeah, you heard that right. Uh, metals like zinc and copper are often used in their mill finish form. Additionally, anodized aluminum is sometimes used. Um, anodization is not really a coating on the metal, but rather a treatment of the surface of the aluminum that actually changes it. So uh, we got a couple things here. I believe the project on the left is a galvalume roof that had a, a clear acrylic coating on it that was on there primarily just for forming the metal. The clear acrylic coatings tend to weather away after a few years, leaving you with just the bare galvalume. Uh, the project on the right is anodized aluminum. And as you see there, they have also done something kind of cool to bring in some variants of color and shading and toning on the roof for a little extra character as well. Um, the next type of coating I will mention is what we call a stone or aggregate coating. Uh, these are commonly used only on modular steel panels. And really for the property owners, these aggregate coatings create a nice, um, as I call it, bridge from asphalt shingles into metal because um, it's a similar coating to what they've seen on asphalt shingles, um, but now it's on a steel base. And so they understand inherently the strength of that steel base and what that means. Um, another nice thing about the stone coatings is they can do some very cool stuff in terms of blends of colors, providing burst of colors to give some very natural or even weathered tile or wood shake sort of looks. Um, the next type of finish is a more traditional paint finish. And these are polyester finishes. And now you're going to find there's a lot of variants of polyester finishes. Um, oftentimes they're called SMP, which stands for Siliconized Modified Polyester. Um, but you will find some different quality points amongst the variants of these coatings. Um, these are probably... Uh, one of the more readily available coatings. Um, they're also the most economical type of painted finish that typically you will find on a metal roof. Um, you will find these oftentimes used on the exposed fastener products as well as on steel standing seam. And then finally, the type of finish is PVDF, which stands for polyvanildine fluoride or FEVE coatings. Um, the PVDF family of coatings are often sold under the trade names of Kynar and Hylar, which you may be familiar with. Um, these particular finishes are really well known for their long-term color retention and chalk resistance. Um, these coatings are also available oftentimes in print coats, meaning that there's more than one color put on the metal. And I chose these three photos intentionally to show you some examples of that. Um, and so these are multi-hued colors uh, designed to look like weathered metal or weathered wood shingles. Um, they can also do specific patterns, maybe to look like slate or something else. So we've looked at metals, we looked at coatings. Let's move on to having a good materials list for your project. Um, having a good materials list for your project is certainly a major key to success. Nothing can cause delays. Nothing is going to upset everyone involved more than having to wait on additional materials to finish the project. Uh, many manufacturers will work with you even when you're in the bidding stage um, to provide a materials list for your project. And they'll do that based upon project drawings or satellite uh, reports you may provide, or maybe even just a hand sketch if it's a re-roof or something. Um, I can't stress enough, of course, if you're going to get your supplier involved, you've got to give them correct information if they're going to give you um, a correct materials list uh, in return. Um, over the years as a manufacturer, uh, it's kind of interesting. I've been involved with a lot of projects uh, where they ran short of materials. And we later discovered that the plans for the structure had changed at some point, but they hadn't bothered to tell their supplier 
uh, that the building had changed and was now a different size or different dimensions. So um, obviously, if the plan or design changes, everyone has to know. But again, um, a lot of manufacturers will build these material lists for you. So you know exactly what trims, accessories, components you need to complete the roof. And they will also be happy to do that while you're bidding the project in order to get you an accurate uh, cost for your own quotation purposes. A lot of times too, if you get the manufacturer involved, they will look at the job and kind of give you some rules of thumb as far as you know how long the labor might take. Uh, they will also oftentimes point out uh, particularly tricky areas or things that you need to pay some extra attention to. Now also, um, if your project involves custom length panels coming from the manufacturer, can't stress enough that field verification of rafter lengths prior to the production of panels is critical. Um, you can always make a panel shorter, um, but I don't have to tell you that out in the field, there really is no such thing as a panel stretcher. We can't make them longer. Uh, now, I shouldn't say that because sometimes you can fudge a little bit with your trims and come up with some different trim designs to make up for short panels. But um, generally speaking, if you're ordering custom length panels, I really encourage you to do field verification uh, before that manufacturer starts to cut the panels for you. Um, other thing is a lot of times on the steel standing seam, uh, your manufacturer is going to be trying to cut those panels to exact lengths for you, which will speed things up from an install standpoint and keep you from having to cut the panels out in the field. Now, obviously hip and valley panels, you're gonna have to cut, um, but as far as straight full length panels, um, ideally you won't have to do much if any cutting of those in the field if everything is done well as far as measurements. So in advance, um, before they ran the, run the panels, your manufacturer is gonna give you a cut list uh, to sign off on before they produce their panels. Make sure you look at that closely and verify its accuracy. Um, now, most manufacturers also will offer some uh, standard preformed accessories with their roof systems. Uh, for heavier gauge products, a lot of times some of the trims like uh, eave drip edges, valley pans, hip and ridge uh, do have to be specially fabricated specific to the roof pitch. If your project requires um, a lot of what appear to be custom flashings uh, that would have to be fabricated by you as the roofing contractor, um, I would suggest checking with the manufacturer, uh, see if they can't make your life simpler and speed up your job site a little bit by making those flashings for you in their shop. Uh, to your specification. Uh, this will save you some time and it will also help to ensure consistency from part to part. Um, finally, can't stress enough, be sure to double and triple check everything. Uh, materials lists, frankly, are a common place of errors. And those errors could be made by any of the parties, you know, any place along uh, the supply chain. So um, I can't stress enough how important it is for you as the contractor to really review and check the material list prior to placing the order. Um, finally, um, well, and, and my point there is that mistakes made at this juncture um, are just really costly in terms of dollars and time. And if you make mistakes, they also really get that project off on the wrong foot. So finally, what, what if you've got a project that has been architecturally specified? So you've got, uh, <laughs> don't try to read that on your screen, but you've got this big sheet of architectural specifications. Sometimes it's easy to let your eyes gloss over and not pay attention to those specifications, but I can't stress enough. Again, if your project involves a product specified by an architect, um, it's critical in the bidding stage as well as in the performance stage that you review uh, those specifications closely and carefully. Um, make sure that the product that you're providing meets those specifications down to the last detail. Uh, sometimes I'll see specs that will spec certain ASTM or other standards, but yet they've also specced a product and that product doesn't meet those standards. Um, so you really need to watch for things like that. Confirm with your manufacturer that all requirements um, from the architect and from the spec set 
um, are being met by the product that you plan to install. Um, architectural drawings may also have very detailed areas, um, such as details on various flashings or roof edges or protrusions. Um, Got to tell you, if the dar architect has drawn it out and he calls out for it, you're going to be expected to meet that requirement. Um, so you want to make sure that any shop drawings, any architectural details are all provided to your project manager and your installation crew. Again, sometimes you get this big set of drawings, this big set of specs. You just, I just want to put a roof up. You don't give them enough thought. And I've seen a lot of guys get in trouble because someone at the last hour discovers that, oh, I used one too few fasteners per square foot or whatever. Um, so it's just really important to understand what those drawings and specs are calling for and make sure that you are meeting those requirements. Now, all that said, I want to stress, if there's something in the specs that simply doesn't make sense or that you know isn't a wise choice, I encourage you to address that with the architect, the property owner, the GC, or other stakeholder as soon as it becomes apparent to you. Um, the reality is specifications are written for a reason, and you're going to be held accountable to them. Um, however, if something doesn't make sense or you know it simply isn't in the best interest of the project, you do have a responsibility to be vocal about that rather than just go along with it. Um, so things that you will not want to ignore um, and you'll want to pay some special attention to attention to will be things like unusual roof geometry, unusual roof shape, um, maybe cases where the product being specified simply doesn't lend itself well to the shape of the roof. Um, for example, um, not all metal roof products have details or trims that are conducive to things like flared gables. Um, trying to use a product not well designed for a flared gable on a flared gable is going to lead to problems. Um, you also may find you've got jobs that have non 90 degree hips and some products handle those better than others. Of course, here on this uh, bay window, they actually hand formed all of that to be able to deal with what was going on there. Um, so I'd stress too, if there are any unusual arcs or angles on the project you're bidding, um, you want to pay close attention to those. Make sure that you have a solid plan for success um, for those areas before proceeding with your bid um, or heaven forbid with even proceeding with the installation. So let's look a little bit at contracts and what those mean. Um, <clears throat> usually when I've seen things go bad on a metal roofing project and the owners and the contractor have simply gotten at odds with each other in some way. A lot of times when that was the case, when I looked at it, there was a really weak contract um, that was governing the project to begin with. And oftentimes um, that contract came down to something so simple as it simply said, install 26 gauge steel standing seam, color brown. Um, that sort of brief contract really doesn't serve anyone well. Um, I think sometimes contractors get an idea that maybe they're safer with a simple contract, but in reality, a very brief contract simply lends itself to all kinds of misunderstandings uh, with property owners, as well as the likelihood of the contractor later being held accountable to certain generally accepted standards that may go well beyond what they actually had in mind. Um, so the format and boilerplate wording of your contract should always be something that you as a company have had reviewed by an attorney before you start using it. Um, you need to make sure that it includes all the appropriate legal verbiage. Um, but after that, a contract should specify exactly how you will perform the work. Um, it should specify specifically what product you're using, um, what finish is on it what the product warranty is, what the workmanship warranty is, which would come from you, uh, what flashing details you're going to use, such as valley style or other trim options that may exist for the particular product being installed. Um, also, if the product you're installing 
carry some inherent risks, such as the possibility of oil canning or perhaps the possibility of some minor color toning where it's not 100% consistent as far as color. Um, those things need to go into the contract as well. And so you want to spell those things out and make sure that everyone is clear, expectations are set, and you have made clear what the limitations are to you in terms of what you can do on that particular project. Um, another thing I will commonly see folks address, especially on re-roofing projects, um, is the potential for masonry issues. It's very wise to point out that just because you apply flashing to the chimney, that does not mean that you're responsible for the performance of the masonry itself. That particular chimney in that photo, I'm thinking it might be a little, it's days are numbered, I shall say. But anyway, um, I will also add if the project has um, existing skylights that are being reused, Generally, that is not something I suggest, especially if the skylights are eight to 10 years old or older. I always suggest replacing them. Um, but you, if you are going to reuse the skylights, you want to specify that in your contract that that's being done so everyone is aware that there are certain risks taken with reusing old skylights. Um, I have also seen property owners over the years uh, maybe you've run into this where the property owner insisted that you did something that you knew was outside the specification of the, the product, such as maybe using a product on too low of a roof pitch. Assuming you don't just walk from that, and sometimes that was going to be your best bet, but assuming you don't just walk, you want to make sure uh, that the contract uh, specifies that the client has dictated that you do what you do. And, you know, one of the reasons you do that is because if what's being done that's outside of spec leads to problems, let's say five years down the road, you want to have clear record when you go back and pull that contract, you want to have clear records showing that you did what the homeowner demanded. And it may not even, and or property owner, it may not even be the same property owner at that point. So again, if you're doing anything outside of spec at the home or at the property owner's assistance, insistence, make sure that you specify that in the contract. Um, a contract really should also specify things like uh, where the materials are going to be staged and stored once they're on the job site. Uh, may seem silly, but you also want to specify if you're going to have a portable toilet and you want to verify where that should be placed. A lot of times homeowners get concerned when that porta john shows up and it doesn't go where they think it ought to go. Um, also, are you doing anything to the roof to make it solar ready? Uh, that should be specified in the contract. And, you know, that could be such as pre-applying mounting brackets on a metal shingle job. It may mean using foam inserts behind the shingle uh, to give it extra strength and extra walkability where the solar array will be installed. Um, another thing you want to make sure your contract specifies is snow guards and whether or not they're included in the project if you're in a northern climate. Um, if they are included in the project, where, how frequently, what type of snow guard, all of that needs to be dictated in your contract. Um, bottom line is the contract specifies your legal obligations to the customer. So you really do want that contract to be as detailed as possible. Uh, the contract is there to guide things to a successful completion where all expectations are met and everyone is happy at the end. So let's go forward and look at ordering and receiving materials. Um, close communication with your supplier during the ordering process and manufacturing will really help things to go smoothly. Um, again, your supplier should be able to help you um, in terms of creating a materials list for your project. Um, in addition to the list of materials, one thing you really want to be clear with your supplier on is their lead time. In recent years in particular, 
Uh, we have seen supply chain issues um, in all industries, and we have seen some pretty wide variations sometimes in lead times. Um, it may also vary from color to color and product to product. So uh, make sure that you receive a at least reasonably reliable estimate of production and delivery from your supplier. So transportation of metal roofing materials to the job um, can be very different uh, with metal roofing than it is with other types of products you may be normally having delivered to job sites. Roof loading, of course, is typically not done with most metal products. Um, it's very important to understand from your supplier how the product will arrive, what sort of equipment, how many people you're going to need to unload it. Um, I would suggest requesting from them uh, in advance, if possible, photos of the shipment as it leaves their location so that you are not surprised by it in any way. Um, and I can't stress this enough. It, you know, it's just, and, and some suppliers will offer unloading service, and that's great if they do it, take advantage of it. Um, but if you're going to be unloading, you really want to make sure you understand how it's going to be packaged so you've got the right equipment to unload it and you know how to unload it without damaging anything. Um, I will also say it's very critical that your team be well inspected or excuse me, well instructed on how to inspect the product before they sign for it. Um, damaged metal roofing is going to be quite costly to replace. Uh, so in the unfortunate event, you do run into that situation where something does show up on your job site and it's been damaged, you want to handle things in a way to make sure that a freight claim can be made. Um, shipping and truck carriers, um, all has gotten very complicated and just difficult in recent years. And you've probably heard stories about it. Um, so again, you wanna make sure if there's anything wrong with that shipment that you sign for it as damaged or whatever um, so that a freight claim can be made because if your person receiving it in does not sign for it as damaged, you are not going to be able to make a claim with the character, with the carrier, excuse me. Um, you also want to make sure that you're receiving everything you signed for. So um, your supplier should tell you in advance the number of packages, the number of things that you're receiving. They should tell you what should be on each pallet or in each crate. Again, want to make sure that you're receiving everything that you're signing for. Um, if you do not sign for the shipment as being short and there is something missing, um, again, you're not going to be able to make a claim with the carrier. So once the materials are on the job site, I really suggest making sure you protect them from theft. Um, scrap metal value, scrap value, especially on metals like aluminum and copper, uh, is really quite high today. And so this can make metal roofing job sites a very tempting target for criminals. So uh, you wanna watch that. Next, you wanna make sure that things are stored so that rainwater um, or even heavy dew can't pond on the roofing materials. That may sound silly because you're saying what's gonna get wet when it's used. Yes, absolutely. Um, but you do not, with most of the coatings used on metal roofs, you do not want water ponding on it or staying there all the time. So sometimes that means if you've got crated standing seam panels, you're going to angle them a little bit to allow stuff to drain out. Um, materials can sometimes be tarp for short periods of time. I would not leave them outside tarp for real long extended period of time. Again, uh, the reality is with most metal roof coatings, moisture held against the coating uh, will eventually soften the coating and that will eventually lead to failure. Um, doesn't happen overnight, don't misunderstand me, but if the materials are sitting there for a few months, for some odd reason, uh, you do not want them sitting there uh, wet the whole time. Um, so building permits, um, you want to be sure to make the job go smoothly to pull all applicable permits required to do the project. Um, in particular, in coastal and high velocity wind areas, as well as in fire zones, 
um, you may have to follow special procedures to meet local code or local engineering requirements. Um, that could impact your fastening patterns uh, as far as how frequently you fasten the panels. Um, it also, in the fire areas, it might impact needing to use a fire-resistant underlayment uh, to meet local fire classifications. Um, it's critical that you understand and adhere to all special local requirements. So one of the fun things I love getting involved in as a manufacturer is what I call pre-construction calls and meetings. And I really encourage these. This is so simple as in advance of starting the project, getting all the stakeholders together for a meeting or a phone call or a Zoom call. Um, you know, that could be all the stakeholders involved at that time. Uh, it should be your manufacturer, if there's a GC. Could include, obviously you wanted to include your installers. It may include the architect. Um, I've even been on pre-construction calls where we invited the property owner to be involved. And this just provides an opportunity to talk things through a bit um, for all players to bring up any concerns or questions they may have. Um, in such a meeting, uh, you're going to discuss a number of things also, you know, even how the materials are going to be staged. Um, this should include any arrangements specified in the contract in regards to where the materials will be stored on the job site. Uh, this meeting can also discuss your anticipated timeline, including the potential impact of weather delays. Um, and also during this time, it's really critical uh, to get your installers introduced to the point person at your manufacturer supplier so they know who to go to if they have any questions uh, during the installation of that project. Um, the pre-construction meeting should also include a review of the contract, um, a review of what the contract spells out so your installers know what they're being held accountable to. Um, you also will want to discuss any manufacturer requirements or architectural specifications that are particular to that project. Um, you will want to review any specified details uh, from the architectural drawings or perhaps shop drawings. Um, those should also be looked at during the pre-construction meeting. So a few other things that are critical uh, to a successful project to make sure that you discuss with your installers include uh, what underlayment is being used, how is it going to be fastened, are there any special considerations about the underlayment, what flashing techniques are supposed to be used? Are single flash, single piece flashings to be used whenever possible or are multi-piece flashings acceptable? How will intersections with walls, roof to wall intersections be handled? Uh, will saw cuts be made into masonry walls? Uh, will termination bars be used to hold flashings against stucco? Will any siding such as hardboard or vinyl or metal siding uh, be removed in order to be flashed behind it? Again, these are all things that you need to make sure your installers know what the expectations are. How is ventilation going to be handled on the roof? How will tie-ins and pitch transitions uh, be handled on the roof? Um, on re-roofing projects, what are they supposed to do if they run into rot, rotted decking? Um, how is that supposed to be handled? Um, is it going to require a change order on the contract? You want to make sure that your installers understand that if the metal panels being installed have protective plastic film on them, that that plastic film must be removed uh, before the panels are installed and certainly before a lot of UV sunlight hits that plastic film and makes it stick like crazy to the metal panels uh, where you'll be picking it off with tweezers. Um, you want to make sure that if you are working with any exotic or natural metals such as copper or zinc or a few others. Um, really, you want your installers to be wearing gloves because otherwise their fingers are going to leave fingerprints that are going to mar the panels badly and potentially be objectionable to a property owner. 
Are you doing anything special on the project to make it solar ready? You also want to make sure that your installers know what their expect what your expectations of them are as far as how they dress on the job site, the language they use, perhaps the music they're allowed to play, uh, you know, what they should do if they smoke, when, where they can do that, what your cell phone policy is, and of course, all of your safety procedures and policies as well. It's also advisable to make sure that your installers know who to contact if they run into anything unexpected. It's very unusual, in fact, not to run into unexpected things on project and uh, on projects. And the last thing you want is your installers to be covering things up or ignoring things and putting the success of that project at work uh, or at, at risk, excuse me. So this sort of communication before the project starts goes a long way, makes everyone comfortable, lets all parties know what's expected of them. And it also specifies how things will be handled if things don't go according to plan. Um, also, this pre-construction call can be very helpful to build a relationship between your installers and your supplier. Making sure that the installers are comfortable in approaching someone if they have technical questions. Uh, many manufacturers also along the way are happy to review in progress photos or videos happy to give advice on projects. I know that we as a manufacturer uh, have even gone out into our training decks and mocked things up and sent videos back to installers showing them how to handle certain things they may have run into. So customer relationships. Um, I strongly advise offering daily project reviews between your project manager and the property owner. For example, in the case of, let's say, a residential re-roofing project, you know doggone well that homeowner is going to be walking around looking at the progress each day after the project, after the <coughs> workers are gone. And in most cases, they're going to see things on that roof that they don't understand or even things that look wrong to them. It's far better um, if rather than have that happen and they are calling you on your cell phone at 10 o'clock at night. Um, it's far better if your project manager has reviewed progress with them each day and proactively addressed uh, the things that you know may look peculiar to them. If the customer, for some reason, is not interested in daily reviews, um, using an app that allows you to share photos and even comments with them each day can uh, be very helpful as well. Um, I also suggest to make sure that the property owner or the client knows who on the job site they can approach if they have questions. I know of one company that does something very cool. So uh, their most experienced crew members wear red shirts, while their other crew members wear blue shirts. And so they tell the client that if they have any questions, go to one of the red shirted guys because they'll be able to help you. And so that helps them know who to contact on the job site if they have questions. Uh, remember, the big thing about clients that they hate the most is being surprised. If during the project anything at all goes awry, it's far better to address it immediately with the customer rather than let it languish. Um, of course, anything requiring a change order or a change of plans uh, to what is in the contract, whether whether or not it involves a price change, that needs to be addressed in writing and signed off on by the customer. Um, punch list. A few days before the project is going to complete, uh, whoever your company leadership person would be should review the work, walk around the job site with the project manager. Um, that's probably going to result in some sort of a punch list of things to be addressed prior to project completion. Um, once anything that came out of that conversation has been done, then you need to have a walk around with the client, uh, which may result in another punch list of things to be addressed prior to completion and fi final billing. So solid communication is always going to be appreciated by your customers. Um, this is one of the things that will make them remember you and hopefully even send referrals your way. And we all love that. 
Um, by the way, I'll say many times I see salespeople disappear after a contract is signed. I really find that that is missing out on a huge opportunity, both during the project and for years to come to get referrals off that project. Um, more than anything, uh, your stellar customer service and beautiful workmanship um, should result in about 30% of your projects each year coming from referral from past projects. So wrapping up, a few critical points. Um, make sure to set clear, agreed upon, and verifiable expectations to all stakeholders. That includes your clients and also your installers. Clear expectations will go a long way in helping projects to go smoothly and making sure that your clients are happy. Um, second thing, invest in your installers. Um, everyone these days talks about the shortage of skilled labor and, and they're right. Um, so your best thing that you can do is to do all you can to continually raise up and invest in your team members so that you're not only keeping them long-term, but you also continually advance them to higher skill levels. Um, operating well and efficiently is always going to bring you to greater levels of success. So, Amanda, I am done and curious if there are any questions. As of right now, there are not, but this is your chance to anyone who is still with us to respond in with any questions you may have. And you see my contact information on the screen. You're always welcome to reach out directly to me, and I'm always happy to talk these things through with anybody as well. I am going to stop my screen share here in a second. Okay, are there any questions? Oh, here we go. What suggestions do you have for preventing job site theft? Yeah, that's a really good question, Karen. Um, you know, I think just normal things. I mean, if you can store things inside, that's great. Um, you know, certainly big crates of standing seam are probably going to be hard for someone to to take off with. Um, they're more likely to try to hit your flashings, or if it's a metal shingle job, those can be really prone to theft because it's easy to just pick up some boxes and carry them off. So I, I think um, trying to keep them inside, you know, if things are stretch wrapped, keep them stretch wrapped. Um, you could even potentially chain things up. And of course, you know, there's other things people do with putting tracking devices on inventory, putting out uh, security type cameras so you can keep an eye on things as, as well. It's a good question. I think keeping things, you know, in a, in a lighted area, in a visible area, um, sometimes, well, you know, the homeowner or the property owner wants me to put all the materials around back so no one sees them and that could be the worst place to put them to, so. Well, this has been very good. All right, awesome. If there are no further questions, then thank you, Todd. And everyone keep an eye for the post MetalCon Live surveys and make sure to check out MetalCon.com for future MetalCon Lives and to get more information on our show in October. Thank you again, Todd. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.